This episode of Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point is sponsored by Blue Bridge Games. For the games and gifts you won't find anywhere else, head to Grand Rapids, Michigan's friendliest local game store, Blue Bridge Games. Blue Bridge Games carries an extensive line of board games, card games, role-playing tabletop games, Magic the Gathering, and more. Stop into their storefront on East Fulton or shop with them online at bluebridgegames.com. You say you want to watch a drama. You say you want to watch a comedy. Well, you can watch it with your mama. Or you can watch it with your daddy. You'll even sit and watch it with your middle schooler. So you can come and talk around our water cooler. We're watching all day and all night. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa, whoa. Couch Potatoes Unite. Whoa. to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point, which is based on a blog of the same name because we are the kings and queens of our own united kingdom of potatoes. Couch potatoes. And we pass down our names too. Also, shout out to our listeners across the pond because we hope you're listening to this particular episode. I'm the blogger in question and the self-styled cheap couch potato. My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and we're checking out our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For at Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and the unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU! Exclamation point! Hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays as well as new blog entries on Tuesdays. And as always, we have several more new episodes on the way because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast the episodes are published once per week subscribe to our website or the podcast via iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio CastBox, Amazon Music basically wherever you get your podcasts to stay on top of brand new episodes episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler including but not limited to Stranger Things iZombie, The Good Place, Game of Thrones American Horror Story, Grace and Frankie Mr. Robot, Charmed, Riverdale Altered Carbon, The Orville, Outlander, and Westworld. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for Doctor Who, The Hundred, Supernatural, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, This Is Us, the DCTU series will talk Season 4 of Black Lightning, and the Star Trek 50 Plus series will discuss Season 1 of Deep Space Nine. We'll be launching new panels covering Big Little Lies, Call the Midwife, The Animaniacs, Killing Eve, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, American Gods, Grey's Anatomy, and Cobra Kai. And because we look back at shows now past, we'll travel through time and experience all sorts of identities with Quantum Leap. We'll thank the Golden Girls for being friends. We'll cry Bazinga for Big Bang Theory. We'll dive deep into the fantasy world of the magicians. We'll navigate the witty political satire of Parks and Recreation. And we'll become psychos for psych. By the way, did you know that CPU also from time to time goes live? We've been live from bunkers, comedy shows, comic cons, game stores, and we're planning more live appearances and other cool stuff, including in whatever times these are. Let's hope they're getting better. So make sure you like or follow us on our Facebook page, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or subscribe to our website, YouTube channel, Apple iTunes channel, Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. In the meantime, if you don't hear your show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews. We always suit new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback! Just keep the paparazzi at bay, if you please, although that might apply more to season five. Today, we're back around the water cooler to discuss season four of Netflix streaming original, The Crown. If you are not already aware, and if you haven't listened to the first three episodes in this panel series, you should know that from time to time, your chief couch potato and main moderator, that's me, needs a break, particularly when I think others are more passionate about the show we're discussing in the moment. Case in point, today's episode, I'm not here to moderate. Rather, frequent panelist Krista returns to the moderating microphone once again for this series. While yours truly settles into the discussion as a participating panelist, Krista and I are further joined by returning CPU Royals, Spencer, Samantha, Kristen T, and Todd for this fourth season talk. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome back Krista to the moderating microphone. Take it away, Krista. Hi, Kylie. This is Associate Couch Potato Krista, and we are here to talk about season four of Netflix's The Crown. The Crown follows the British royal family from when Queen Elizabeth is crowned queen to, I believe they're going to go pretty close to the present by the end of the sixth season. 
season four, we are discussing the years 1979 to 1991. And at this time, I would like the panel to introduce themselves and rate their interest in this show, and they are welcome to pick more than one. Are you watching because duty calls and duty is everything? Like Queen Elizabeth. Are you watching because it's a bit of fun? Perhaps masking something quite dark, but maybe a gin pick-me-up will help like Princess Margaret. Are you watching because it's better than your miserable, loveless life, like Princess Anne or Prince Charles? Do you find the royal family impossible and will never fit in, like Prime Minister Thatcher? Or it started like a fairy tale and now it's just a nightmare, like Princess Diana? Who wants to go first? Who I'll go first. Well, first of all, I, I have to say, Kylie, okay, that was a great deal of information in a very, very tiny span. Of, I, I, I was watching you because I can see you. I think I don't think you breathed that entire <laughs> first like few minutes. I don't know how you do that, but I'm gonna put your name out there to the world to read those really really fast things at the end of medical like <laughs> prescription drug commercials because I think you would just be brilliant. Yes. Thank you. I think Todd. <laughs> Quite amazing. I, I'm just, that's, that's a feat of magic. So yes, I'm Todd, very excited to be part of the panel again. The Crown is truly, I, I don't know, see, I was confused at which of these to pick because I think it's the first one, but that sound, you know, saying that, you know, it's because duty calls, it makes it sound like I kind of have to do it. I am watching because I adore this freaking show. I just, I did not expect to love it. I think I said this before on, on one of our other panels. I didn't expect to love this show nearly as much as I do. It is must watch for me. It is, I binge them as soon as they come out. And I don't do that with very many shows. I think the series is darn near perfect in nearly every way with just an occasional little hiccup here or there. Why am I watching? I, I, I'm watching because I, I love it. I love them all. I just want to <laughs> give them all big hugs because they need hugs. All of them need hugs. Perhaps we can have a special category as sort of an homage to Prince Philip of a, we liked everything, it's wonderful. Because he yes. does look a happy dude. I love it. The, the, the we want to give them all crown hugs category. Uh, that's what I meant. They are all quite sad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, who's next? Thank you, Todd. I'm going to pick Samantha. Well, I, I almost volunteered myself because I think I'm on the opposite spectrum of Todd. Oh, no. I wasn't sure if we I can't wanted to do the that. same last name, then. We just can't. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they might be distantly related. <laughs> We'll never know, because Todd's going to quit talking to me after this panel, I'm sure. So the series at a whole, I think I met Princess Diana now, and I was going to say Prime Minister Thatcher for just this season, but given how Todd introduced the character question with the duty calls, maybe I'm Queen Elizabeth this season, because I was ready to check out, but I enjoy talking on this panel, so I stuck with it, and here I am despite how dreadful I thought it was. And I think it's because it's just so sad. Wow, yes. spicy, well, Samantha. <laughs> I've, I've watched this season twice. When it first came out, I couldn't finish it. Wow. And then more recently, I watched it again because I hate not being able to watch the whole thing when we're going to talk about it. And I'm glad that I did. I, gosh, it's sad. I, I just want to point out that you watched voluntarily, that your producer I, did not make you watch this show. Because this that has is been correct. a running That theme. is my own <laughs> self-inflicted rule. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That last season of Orange is the New Black, we all said we only watched it because Kylie made us. <laughs> last year? No. Not a witch? Orange is the New Black. No? Oh. Am I wrong? Well, I won't You're throw wrong. accusations like that around. I know Thanks. that I did this to myself. <laughs> Welcome back, Samantha. <laughs> Hello. This is Kristen T. Hi, Kristen T. Hi, and I pop up from time to time on a few different panels. Downton Abbey, This Is Us, and Sherlock, I believe, are my other three. I had a hard time with this rating question as well, so I'm kind of liking Todd's edition of this Philip character, because I also love The Crown. I love the storytelling. I love the depth into which we get to know these characters. Unlike Todd, I don't binge it, I savor it. I like to have a little bit of it and then think about it, talk about it, reflect on it, then watch a little bit more, like a good long dinner. And I wouldn't say I'm fully in the Philip camp, though I have to say I maybe Philip with a little bit of hint of Margaret Thatcher because this 
particular series, I just wanted to sit them all down and say, look, if you would talk to each other truthfully and honestly, half of these things would not even be deals. So, but obviously it's history and that do no good. And yeah, but that's, that's where I am. Welcome Thank back. Kristen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Spencer. I'm on numerous panels from comic books to British shows to sci-fi to things to come. And I would say that I am Margaret, but that's purely for the gin. Because <laughs> you didn't like anything else but the gin? No, I think the show's fantastic, but that character description had gin in it. <laughs> Should be noted that we are recording virtually and his name is anyone but Charles. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and he's doing some sort of weird pop-up. What? <laughs> Welcome back, Spencer. Thank you, Kylie. And All right, uh, then it is our Chief Couch Potatoes turn. It is, That's because I'm not moderating, which is a glorious break for me. I don't remember what I was last time either, and I think you've changed these. I've Good always... Question. Yes. I've always been the one that has not been quite on the... I love it so much, camp, but I'm definitely not in the I think it's miserable and sad camp either. <laughs> so All the characters were miserable and sad this time. I didn't have a lot to work with. I know, I know, I know. But it's a, it's a quality show, and even despite my various misgivings, which actually change from season to season, I have different ones this time, I still binge this show. Like, I cannot stop watching this show. I start the season and then it's done within two days. And I, I'm not a savorer. I'm definitely a let's eat the big meal and the dessert too kind of person when it comes to the crown. So I am going to pick Princess Margaret, but I would like to change gin to bourbon or wine or anything but gin. <laughs> so... <laughs> During How very American of you. I don't care. <laughs> but that was like, I read some article about like Princess Margaret's real daily schedule. And did it include a gin midday pick-me-up? I'm sure it did, and it's very British of your description and Spencer to <laughs> remark upon it. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I was Princess Margaret in the past. I think it's a bit of fun. It's masking something quite dark. Maybe a pick-me-up will help, but it's a quality show. I really do enjoy it. It's like a 4.5 out of 5 kind of a place for me. And this is also the season from when, you know, I was alive when a lot of this stuff happened. So it's interesting to see a new perspective, dramatically reenacted perspective. But that's my opinion, and Krista. <laughs> and me. So I, similar to Kristen, felt like a little bit like Margaret Thatcher, which is weird if you knew me, but I also would have really hated being at Balmoral. I also would have left. They were being jerks. But other than that, I really enjoyed it. It's probably not my favorite season, but potentially my second favorite season so far. So I guess I'm a little bit in my made up Philip camp as well. So. The one that you, the secret option that you did not include in the original talking points. <laughs> That's fine. I, I knew I was missing someone, but like in my brain, I couldn't figure out who it was when I was trying to do, do it quickly, and this is what happens. My first thing I wanted to bring up is we finally got to meet Princess Diana. Oh, that's exciting. What did we think? What did we like? What did we not like? Well, I'm um, highly in that this is the first season that started to overlap with my life and what I remember when I was very little. And I think maybe that's some of my hangups with this season, you know, in some of the romanticizing that happens, you know, as a little girl and thinking that everything's wonderful and being hit with the reality of when it inevitably happens. So sort of reality. Well, I mean, we all know that, you know, they ultimately didn't have a good marriage and they divorced. So like dramatized or not. We know it wasn't all roses. That's what I did love so much about. I, I will say up front, this is probably overall my least favorite season of the series. Oh, interesting. I'm not exactly sure why, but I have some ideas of why. And I think part of it is the degree to which this was Diana focused and it didn't spread it out quite as much. We didn't get as much from other characters as I feel like maybe we did in other seasons. And I was admittedly, I, you know, I wasn't a big follower of the Charles and Diana thing when it was really happening. I mean, I was aware of it, but I, 
I really didn't follow it that closely, so I wasn't as invested in that part of it. But what I will say is the young woman they cast as Diana, at first I wasn't sure what to make of it. At first I was I I, I was I thought maybe she wasn't a good actress. And then as the season went on, or as the series went on for the people across the pond and for Spencer and Kristen, <laughs> who referred to it as a series, as the series or season went on, I thought she was just amazing. I thought she was fantastic. She grew on me immensely as an actress as the piece went on. And I felt very much like this was a, I felt like this was kind of an episode of Behind the Music. It was, what's the stuff that happened to the band that we didn't know when we thought everything was just concerts and magic and amazing and whooping and hollering and what was going on potentially for real. Certainly from a Princess Diana standpoint, which is intriguing because she couldn't be interviewed, obviously. We don't know exactly from her point of view what was going on, but this season felt very much from her point of view. And I thought that was an interesting way to go about it. And my heart broke watching every single episode. It broke for her. It broke for everyone. Yeah. So that's that's where I'm kind of coming from. I, I'm, in, I'm in near full agreement with Todd on that. This was by far my least favorite season, mostly because it felt over-dramatized. Now, I was still living in England when all of this took place. And to me, this season felt very much like a character assassination of Princess Diana. The people at the time, I got the, the glamorous side, the happy side, the everything we all knew until after her death stuff. So it felt strangely in conflict from the reality I knew between 79 and, and, and 91. The two performances, though, that were three performances I enjoyed the most in this season were the young lady that played Diana. The, the new <laughs> Philip is so much better than Matt Smith was. Matt Smith, I found, I want to say, wooden. And then Gillian Anderson playing Margaret Thatcher was fantastic. She had the cadence, the mannerisms, so shout out to hometown, hometown Grand Rapids girl, Gillian Anderson, for her portrayal of Margaret Thatcher, one of the better portrayals of anybody we've seen in the show so far. I also want to piggyback on that because I agree that season four is my least favorite season of the four. I actually thought Emma Corrigan was amazing from moment one. Her capturing of Diana's mannerisms the way she tilted her head, the vocal inflections, the use of oh gosh, which Diana did often say in interviews. I completely suspended my disbelief for her, which I thought was going to be so difficult because, you know, Charles and Di were so much a part of the, the global lexicon for, for a decade there. And I also remember the fairy tale from my childhood. And I don't know that I was tuned in enough to care about the fairy tale as much, but it, I at least was aware of it. So I knew walking into this season that we were probably going to see a very shadowy depiction of Diana because... Everything about that relationship has always been sensationalized from moment one, so why wouldn't this be? I also agree with Gillian Anderson. Oh my gosh, I love the X-Files, and she is forever Scully for me, but oh, she did such a great job as Thatcher, and that was going to be a tough one to pull off, I think. Again, because Margaret Thatcher was so omnipresent in the news, and I just remember her very graphically from that time, and it, I think she did a marvelous job, and Tobias Menzies is wonderful. But I agree, it was very Diana-focused. It was almost exclusively that, and that was a little odd to me, but at the same time, I, I don't remember that the royal family had much other news being told about it at the time, and... This show has been very plain about the fact that the accounts that they're depicting are from articles and magazines and, and not direct interviews with the actual members of the royal family, but interviews they gave to the press or to biographers or whatever. And so I guess I'm not surprised by the direction it took, but I also didn't necessarily enjoy watching it as much as the first three seasons. Yeah, I, I also thought that I'm, I'm 
pretty sure part of the reason that it's so Diana focused is that is what the majority of the world, that's the part of that family that the majority of the world knows the most about. That's when news and television and magazines and everything all over the world, they were in the news constantly, specifically her. And I think a little bit for me to the detriment of the season, again, I still really enjoyed it. I just enjoyed it a little less than the other seasons. But I think this was them catering to what they think the audience wants most out of the crown. And after watching The Crown, I don't think that's the case. I think what made The Crown work so well is how we're seeing stories of all of these people simultaneously. And we might have an entire episode dedicated to, to Churchill. We might have another episode that's primarily dedicated to Philip. You know, And I love that aspect of it. Got a little less of a sense of that here. And I wonder how much of that did have to do with Peter Morgan and the rest of the team thinking, yeah, this is what the people really want. Let's give them a season dedicated more to her than anything else. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a lot of those sort of zoomed in portions about Thatcher, but it almost deflated the queen in that she, all of her interactions were about that relationship. We didn't see her independent of that. And maybe that's just natural because she's not someone to put herself out there under a spotlight anyway. And especially as she ages, you know, to your point, it's all about the, the younger crew at that time because that's where the focus was. But I definitely miss the queen. And I, I think one of my favorite episodes from the season is, oh gosh, the one where the guy broke in and was talking to her in her bedroom. Oh, that was that. so good interplay so between the two of them. So that was like the, the nice glimmer. And then you almost had that called out at the very end by Philip when he was saying, you know, this is all about Elizabeth. Like you need to back off because you're, you're clearly, you know, thinking the spotlight should be on you. Whether that's accurate or not, who the heck knows. But I think it's almost reflective of even the, the creative process that they took for this season of making it all about Charles and Diana. And then at the end being like, hmm, no, this really isn't what it's about. That is interesting to think about, too, with just the, the juxtaposition of, and historically this happened, right? But the, but the story arc of Diana and the story arc of Margaret Thatcher being both in this same time period as such, I guess, enigmatic people for attention and for media to be following, I almost felt in a way like the storytelling was designed specifically to provide a, I guess, unmasking maybe of some of the things that were in the news at the time. I'm too young to remember them happening when they did, but I'm interested in a lot of the historical events. And so it makes me really wonder and want to read more about these particular times and things. The the death of Mountbatten, for example, in the first episode was something that seemed very impactful to Charles and wasn't something that I was even aware of in a big part of the story, as well as the Falklands War with Thatcher later on in the series. Another historical fact I know, but not a lot about. So I think the idea that we got a little taste of those was good. I really would have liked to see more of the characters' interactions throughout those, not just as we've talked about the focus on Charles and Diana. Also, it just made me really wonder, was there ever a time once Diana came into Charles's life that she was happy? Were, were there points? I mean, I remember hearing that when she was helping others and caring for children, she seemed to be at her most natural. But we really don't get to see much of that at least yet. I, Glimpse it in there. Yeah, I think the, since we haven't crossed into the 90s part of Diana's life yet, I think the sort of age charities and things that she started to deal with were more in that decade, and we'll probably see more of that. We saw a glimpse of it in the last episode or two yeah. here. I think we'll see more of it later. I think what the show depicts is true. You know, I think she was happiest as a mother, to William and Harry. Oh, now they're the people in the news. <laughs> so weird. And I think that, yeah, when she had sort of those human connections outside of the family and outside of her role as Princess of Wales, she probably was happier. But I think that, and maybe this is part of the assassination thing that Spencer was talking about, so I'll defer to him there. But in terms of her marriage to Charles, I just, I think the show is advancing a theory that 
is pretty easy to believe. He was never happy, so she was never going to be happy, no matter how you sliced it. How do we like her introduction? At first, I was nervous. I, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about either her, the actress, or her the introduction of the character but then as more of the season went on i just became more and more enamored with both the presentation of the character and the representation of the character that first introduction as i recall it because it has been a while i mean it's been since the series or since the season premiered since i've seen it but as i recall the first scene was her very very young and and he was there to meet and talk with her sister Correct. Her, he was picking her sister up for a date and she was rehearsing her ballet. Right. And she was, and, like and she 13. was, and she was very much in the back. And she, it, I mean, it was represented very stalker-esque. I mean, I remember watching it going, well, this is an interesting take. I wasn't expecting this. I mean, it felt like she was stalking him in the way it was filmed the way it was edited together. And I'm curious if, because again, I, as I mentioned before, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge of Princess Diana. And I mean, I, I, I was very familiar just seeing her on the news and stuff like that, but I didn't follow the Di Charles relationship all that closely as it was happening. But I'm curious if other people felt that as well, that kind of stalker, that kind of strange feeling of of the way it was edited. And was that done on purpose? Did I is there something I didn't know about their relationship or something that the directors and writers and editors may have made that choice consciously? I did notice that and coming at it from kind of a similar standpoint of not knowing much, just from what I remember when I was a kid and very much getting into the fairy tale part of it and what you saw in the news. So based on how they portray a lot of the characters this season, I always tended to think as I was watching it, like the creators and directors really don't like these people <laughs> in thinking of the royals. And it, and it seemed to be quite a negative season, I thought, in their portrayals. So I don't know if that was an intentional in that way, but it definitely seemed to portray her as being out to become a royal. One thing I thought that was kind of interesting about the scene is how she was in costume to rehearse her ballet, mm -hmm. um, at least partially, because it seemed to give us a little indicator that she was an artistic person and that performance was important to her. And that becomes comes into play a lot more later in the series. That was a detail I didn't know before this. That is, that is interesting. I wonder how much of that was to portray her youth as well. But I mean, she, the actress already looked quite young anyway. So I, but the thing is, is I, and I, I, I said earlier, you know, Hey, do you think they did this? Of, of course, do you think they did this on purpose? Of course they did. Peter Morgan's a smart guy. All of the writers, the editors, everyone involved with the show is incredibly smart. And I don't believe that anything that ends up in this show is remotely by accident. Right. I just couldn't come up with a reason why. And, and that's maybe that was an interesting thing, Samantha. You said, you know, that as we've talked about before, that, you know, maybe maybe they don't really like these characters very much. And yet the way Diana's character was presented over this season was very sympathetic, I thought. I mean, at least that's what I took from it was she was kind of, I think, representing the rest of us in a lot of way, uh, ways as outsiders who don't even remotely know what it must be like to be part of the royal family, bringing us in to follow her. So if that is indeed the thing they were going for was to have her be sympathetic, I also think it's an interesting choice of how they represented her at the beginning because it didn't feel sympathetic at all to me. It felt, like you said, does she want to be royalty? Is she already eyeing an opportunity here? If that is the case, that we are following Diana's perspective of everyone kind of sees this as like something you aspire to, now maybe not aspire, but who doesn't want to be rich and wear fancy outfits? You know, and then kind of how that flips as a viewer, the general, you know what I mean. You I was just raising I mean. my hand for anyone. That's just, you know what I'm <laughs> trying to say of where, and then you get into it and then it's nothing like you imagined. And sure, that yes. That could be a metaphor for anything people aspire to be of sometimes the grass is always greener. Be and, careful what you wish for. Yeah. yeah. And I think as unlike in previous seasons, they were very sympathetic towards Philip. And I think we got to see him as a very nurturing father. Except for when it comes to Charles. Correct. Except right. when it comes to Charles, because for some reason, Nobody likes Charles, but I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's not wrong. When I think back about Diana and how we first introduced her, we see her dance a lot. We see her dance in that first introductory scene. 
Mm-hmm. We see her dance in once she's in the palace and she's basically the fairy tale has men- melted and she's in this almost feels like prison like place with her room absolutely packed with flowers and the, the lessons with her unsympathetic grandmother. And then we see her dance on the stage for a birthday surprise for Charles later on. And it's really interesting to me to just see the transition throughout there with her story like that I guess as part a person who who is a performer and who has that drive I felt like it was pulled in and then she was able to release it out in that final dance moment but it made me feel even more sympathetic towards her because she was so trapped in this kind of performance becoming this princess becoming this part of the royal family what's expected of her it seems to kind of fight with the kind of performance that she did the kind of free dancing we saw near the beginning and near the end so i don't know that was interesting to me and kudos to the actress portraying her emma i think if i'm remembering correctly that you can tell that she's really most happiest in those moments yeah in just the way she played it physically very light when she's performing. And I guess maybe maybe I'm being too harsh in the in the they don't like these people assessment because I do see where you're saying what you're saying Todd with it being sympathetic, but I found this season to be very sad. And yeah. that that portrayal, you know, you go from sort of that stalker mentality to see all of her turmoils with Diana throughout the season and then you see that reflected in Charles a bit and in Thatcher a bit, you know, as the season progresses of very... Yeah, I I felt for all these characters this season so much. I mean, I I may be the outlier here, but I I still felt a lot for Charles throughout this season. I mean, we were seeing it a lot. I mean, the way he treats Diana, terrible, of course, absolutely. But I I, I, I still feel, felt a lot of sympathy for what the character's been through, not how he's dealt with it. But what he's been through and and just another a yet another person feeling like, you know, feeling trapped in a situation that they normally would not have wanted to be in. I don't I don't feel like Charles wants to be part of that that family as far as having to be in the public eye and all of that stuff either. And I don't know, I felt I, I still felt sympathy, not nearly as much as I did as in the previous seasons. But I think I was carrying a lot of what those previous seasons built for his character into this one as well and getting to see the fallout as it's impacting another person in a way that, you know, in in many ways felt like, hey, I got to I got to see a villain become a villain. You know, I got to see a person. I, I saw the backstory of what caused him to be that way. And he's not the only one that's that's incredibly cruel to her through this season. The entire family is. Yeah. I just wanted to revisit the phrase stalker mentality. I I don't see any of that in the Princess Diana character. I think that's very much, you've pointed to her youth, she's coming in costume. We're seeing sort of this coy puppy dog love is what I would say. Sort of that fairy tale prince kind of interaction where she's, you know, she's playing it coquettishly, but I don't see it as, I think Krista explained it before, she's getting wrapped up in sort of the family without realizing what is happening in the moment, only to, as she marries Charles and everything else and kind of works through their marriage, realize that she didn't bargain for what she ultimately got herself into. Number one. I'll, I'll need to watch that. I'll need to watch that again. And again, I'm only talking about literally her first scene. That's the only scene in the entire season that felt that way to me. I'll need to watch it again because maybe I will read it differently the second time I see it. But the first time I saw it, it was shot like it was shot like somebody who had a plan a motive and was honing in on somebody in in a negative way to me, just in the way it was shot and edited. And I can't put my finger on exactly why. So I'll have to watch that first episode with her again and see maybe I I won't feel it as much this time. For me, I felt it was more that she was very, very curious about seeing this royal in her house. And I I didn't get any stalkerish vibes whatsoever. Hmm. With regard to feelings for Charles, yes, the, the first few seasons I gained a lot of sympathy for him that you know, maybe I hadn't had in real life growing up in England and, and, and seeing all this play out in the newspapers, obviously not to this level of drama that we have in the show. But I, I'll say that this season doused him in kerosene and set fire to any sympathy I have ever had for the man. He came across as one of the most despisable human beings out there. I, I really 
found him to be incredibly cruel, no matter what Diana did. And most of what she did was with such great intention. And I believe that she really did love him up until the point where there was no reason to anymore, which I believe probably should have come a lot sooner. But, you know, family and duty in that realm plays a very important role. I I just can't see how how anybody could be left with any sympathy for him after the way in which he treated her so soon after they were married. Yeah, I everybody has expressed before or talked before, at least in some measure, that they felt some sort of sympathy for the Charles character, we'll say, in terms of the show. But I I never have, I think. (laughs) clear about that (laughs) so i think they've given us a reason to sort of try to to give some perspective into the life of quote the heir to the throne and all of those things he has to give up as a human being and all of the parental difficulty that he had especially relating i guess to his father but in the end i think the show gives us what we saw play out in the media just extra intimate and up close and personal, which is sort of this peevish, that's my word lately, peevish reaction to that role and how he should be treating somebody who he's forced to marry versus the person that he was steered away from marrying, which is, of course, Camilla. I don't know. I don't think they care seen anything. I think they were maybe trying to, to bait you into to thinking he was relatable and symp- sympathetic and then, you know, pulled the, pulled the proverbial rug if you were along for that ride. But I guess I just was never... I knew where we were going because I knew Charles and Diana were going to be the subject of this season. And I've never... I've never once seen a sympathetic version of Charles in this story. Somebody wow. can tell me. <laughs> I, okay, I got I, I got to ask you a question, Kyla. That's okay. interesting. Okay. You, you've Time. never felt a tiny bit of sympathy for Charles in all the seasons of this so far? Maybe when he was a child. Not because I wonder how much, I wonder, I'm just curious. I mean, I know that's not why we're here. We're not here to delve into the whys necessarily, but I'm just curious oh, if, if how much of that has to do with watching Having the be- the understanding of what happened in real life as that stuff was going on, do you feel like you came into it expecting to hate Charles in with every fiber of your being, or because I felt immense that that episode where he goes away to school, or, or what, there there's an episode where I, I, I was I was shedding a, a little bit of a tear for Charles. I, I have to admit, I felt really bad for the guy and his connection with with his uncle. Yeah, a little bit bad. No, no, All of no, no. I, I just I felt so much for him. That's that's interesting. I mean, again, I'm not I'm not saying that I rationalizing how he responded to it to Diana and everything that was horrible. Although I think I think she was the, I think she was the way he could lash out and say no to his family because he could never say no to them himself, and this was something that they were pushing on him, and he knew he could bully her. She was she was a tool. In a way, it felt like for him to get back at his family. And it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But I think it was born from all the stuff that happened to him up until that point in his life. I I think very little of it had to do with how he truly regarded Diana. I think he never regarded her as anything but an opportunity to get back at his family in a way. I don't know. I could be reading that completely wrong as well. No, I think just to respond, since he asked me the question, I, 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 I agree with your take on his attitude toward Diana, and I don't want to say that I hate Charles with every fiber of my being. <laughs> <laughs> that but, might have me, me been me putting words in your mouth, Okay, Kyla. okay, well, just to <laughs> take them out. <laughs> I took them back, I took okay, them back. Okay, great. I, you know, Charles is, what the show, I think, has really done is latched on to the public persona of each of the royals. And I'm talking about each of the four, the prince prince says the princes and princess as well like because remember they compile the scripts from public documents biographies interviews and so forth they have never done any direct interviews with any of the royals to write this script it's a piecing together of what we know of public with a little artistic license into the private realm so i don't walk i never walk into it preparing to hate Charles it's just that at the time the young adult version of him comes on the scene and I can't think of the actor's name who plays him in these these last two seasons Josh Josh yeah we'll look it up for for the rich post it's he just won an Emmy just the other day I know it won a a lot of Emmys (laughs) this show won quite a few Emmys I just Josh O'Connor Josh O'Connor 
I guess I just never was drawn into, I, I felt like the show was trying to manipulate me a little bit into that sympathy that I didn't think was necessarily deserved because he'd already, I believe that he had a very cold and distant relationship with his parents, especially Prince Philip. I believe that he struggled all his life with the idea that he was going to inherit the throne in some respect and couldn't just do whatever he wanted when he wanted, which is I think part of the Camilla love affair. But when it comes to the progression of his character from school all the way up into this sort of young adult, young prince role, I was not feeling especially sympathetic to him before Diana came and then Diana came. And for me, it just was like, well, there it is. There's the Charles we all know from the media depictions, potentially. And I think for this season in particular, it really highlighted how much, or at least it portrayed to me as entitlement by the royals. Mm -hmm. Like Elizabeth is the only one who's really in it for duty. And this is what we do. I don't need a lot of fanfare. And, you know, it's showing all of the estates and to your point, Kylie, of just can't quite remember who made the point of, of Charles rebelling. So it's like, okay, you're enjoying, you know, living in these estates and doing your gardening and having all these people help you, the opulence of that lifestyle, but you don't want any of the work that comes along with it. That's how you rebel is you get a fancy estate away. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it wrong all the time. I know, right? Where's my fancy estate with the opulent garden? <laughs> I just like listen to punk rock and wore black t-shirts. Yeah, well, that's that was a how different I kind of rebellion. Yeah. Eyeliner. So much bad eyeliner. Oh my god. <laughs> so was it this series or the last one that had this this season where Charles was going to be an actor at either Oxford or, Ch or Cambridge and was pulled away for royal duties? I think I'll learn Welsh. Yeah. Oh, that was I think he was going to be in the footlights. I think it was going to be in the footlights, which is where Monty Python came from, and a lot of very, very famous British actors came through there. And I think that's a great deal as to why whenever Diana did anything theatrical or dramatic, he may not have known that it was jealousy, but it was jealousy manifesting because it was something that he had a passion for and was taken away from him. Yes, just like you took my point away from me, but I agree. <laughs> I'm sorry. Kylie, edit that out. Hashtag Listen, you, and you, you two being on the same wavelength, that can't that can't happen. Oh no. <laughs> That's <dynamics>. All right. <laughs> Do we have anything else to add to the Is Charles terrible discussion? <laughs> No, I think we pretty much answered it. He is, he is, he is quite awful. <laughs> yeah. All right, then let's move on to going through the episodes just a tiny little bit. Episode one, the gold stick, or no, no, the, just gold stick. So Margaret Thatcher becomes the first female prime minister and Lord Mountbatten is killed by the provisional IRA, which we already we kind of touched on a little bit, especially with the Philip Charles relationship or lack really thereof. I personally didn't know, I mean, obviously I know about the Troubles, I'm not completely in a bubble, but I didn't know that a member of the royal family was killed by the IRA. Yeah, and is is this, remind me, because again, it's been a while since I've seen it, but this is the explosion this is the scenes, right? Explosion, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where they blow right. up Manbatten and his family. nephews. Or, yeah, yeah on, on the, on the boat, the right? The boat. Yeah, okay. that actually happened. I, that, that, that was probably the most historically accurate thing in this season. It was incredible. I, now, I didn't know of that either, at least not to that degree. And I have to say, of all the things they've done on this show up until this point, this I think the filming of that scene was the most cinematically, incredibly tense thing that they have done. I disagree. It was. It, it is absolute perfection from a cinematography, editing, sound design, for building the tension up until the moment when that boat explodes, I was in awe. I, I was riveted. About, about the, the, the slur, the sludge, coming and killing all of those people in Wales? That, oh, would that okay, that would be a very close second. That would be a very close second. That one, slurry, that one didn't build... That one was more of a shock, but it didn't have quite as much of a slow build of tension. They were all me. singing the song all the children were singing and then they had to go hide it under their desks sorry I, well see, no I, that I, I agree the with reason, i think is because for me i didn't see the sludge avalanche coming i didn't feel like it was setting that up whereas the boat blowing up 
that entire thing leading up to it, I'm like, oh, shoot, someone's about to die and it's going to be awful because yeah. the way they were ramping up the tension, I wasn't sure how, I wasn't sure what, you know, exactly what was going to happen. But I'm like, this is going to be really bad. Whereas the other scene with the avalanche, the resolution of it was horrible and it took me completely by surprise. Oh, Maybe, it didn't maybe. take me by surprise. I was like, why are we focusing on all these other random people? Oh, something's going to happen. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The te- the tension build for the Mountbatten scene was was far far more imposing for me at least. I agree with Todd. That was you knew that the there was a murder about to happen, so you had that that build that gut. You you saw it all coming. Whereas the other one, you didn't really see it coming. It was a horrific event, but you didn't like. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! You know, it, 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 there's a different feel to that. Even if you, is, even if you did true. see the other one coming, it was a shorter path to the goal. Yeah, this is yeah. ominous. I will say that moment though, the, the the moment of that that sludge avalanche is probably the most shocking moment for me in the entire series because it was actually that point, cold. Yeah, they really hadn't done anything like that. That feels like something that you would see happen in a in a movie, mm-hmm. you know. And and I mean, even to a point of where you're watching it, you're like, "There's no way that happened. No way did that really happen," you know. Right. So it was yeah. such a shock. Yeah. And being a historical event that I had personally never heard of as well, that episode was very very interesting to me. I again, I also need to go back and rewatch the part the Mount Batten episode because. It was so long ago that I saw it, but I remember hearing just like little bits about. Oh, never mind, Kylie, edit this out. I lost my point. Aye, aye. <laughs> okay. Kylie, if I pay you twenty pounds, will you leave that in? Yes, because the pounds are more than the dollar. You don't even have pounds. <laughs> oh, I will go and I will get my money exchanged because. I, <laughs> You know no, what? I'm not going to do that. And I'm, I'm easy. Not. Here and at cheap. CPU Podcast, we will accept any form of currency <laughs> as we are trying to build a website. <laughs> I have Monopoly money. <laughs> monopoly money. <laughs> Spencer, take your Monopoly money. And Okay, anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> the Mountbatten scene was very good, but you also just casually dropped... We had Margaret Thatcher come into the Thatcher. Prime Ministry, who was played by the inimitable Gillian Anderson, best known as Dana Scully in The X-Files, but also in Sex Education and a bunch of other stuff. Because She's, she's like, awesome. so amazing in Sex, sex Education. I she is. She's mind. so not... Mar- I mean, like, if you want to see her playing something as far from Margaret Thatcher as possible, at the same time she's doing Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> Sex Education is the thing to watch. It's, it's amazing. I, I love think, her one um, Emmy just the other day. Yeah, I think that she really deserved the Emmy for this role. She had the mannerisms, the intonation, and she didn't play it as a caricature. She she really embodied Margaret Thatcher the same way in which Gary Oldman did in The Darkest Hour as Churchill. You you were able to completely see past there was somebody acting the role, and you felt in many ways that you were watching this person. Yes. Yeah. There's that. There's that extreme danger when you're an actor coming in to play a real person that that the entire world has watched for decades on the news. You know, they know how she speaks. They know how she walks. They know how she looks. There's that real danger of of turning it into an impression rather than embodying the character. And I didn't feel like she ever slipped into impression mode. I thought right from the, and I think part of it for me at least was that watching her, I mean, they did a lot, as I recall, they did a lot of close-ups of her through this entire season. And I don't think that was an accident because you look at her eyes and Gillian Anderson was Margaret Thatcher. I mean, it was right there. There there may have been a little bit of impersonation, a very perfect impersonation on the outside for her to get the character down. But I saw her feel every moment of what Margaret Thatcher was going through, and it completely sold me on it. It was it was, it was miraculous to watch. Amazing. Brilliant. I, mean, I really I- felt like it was a master class in acting and just absolutely brilliant to watch. You could not take your eyes off her whenever she was on screen. I'm her and Olivia Coleman scenes together as well were some of the yeah. most compelling scenes of this oh, entire yeah. show. Absolutely. Powerhouses. Hey, Kylie has something to say. I was just going to say actually what Spencer just said, which is my favorite scenes in this season were the Queen's and her scenes because you got to see the Queen as woman interact with the first female prime minister, 
who in many ways was very masculine in her effect and also had to wrangle an entire cabinet of policy makers. pigs. Right. Yep. I mean, yep. I wasn't going to go straight there, Spencer, but if we're saying it, sure, yes, that's exactly just, it. Just the facts. <laughs> yep. Not to mention the fact that Jillian Anderson spent an incredibly long time here in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, and I just want to say again that I love her, and I think she's great, and she's awesome in this role, and she is that kind of an actress. She just is able to embody, she, she goes all in on a performance and tries to pick things that are so different from the last thing so that she can't possibly be typecast. So the fact that she accepted this role was surprising. The fact that she did well with it is not at all surprising to me. And can I just say that having the Emmys just happen, having the Crown, you know, take as many well-deserved awards as, I'm so glad that the Crown was leading this. I have not seen Ted Lasso, but every single person oh. I've talked to who has says that it is well-deserved. And and my third and the third one, which is Queen's Gambit, which is one of the best things I've watched all year. To the see world. the incredible things that are happening because of streaming. I mean, ten years ago, it was a joke to ever think that a streaming platform would win an Emmy, and now they're winning all the Emmys. All than just this year as well. It's now been two or three years where yeah. streaming has absolutely dominated the award season. They've just done, they've become what HBO used to be, you know, and even HBO is still doing incredible work. But the thing I love the most about this is look at the incredible opportunities on streaming that older performers and women in particular that normally 20 years ago would have said, my career is over by the time they hit 40. Tragic freaking tragic that now look at, I mean, Jillian Anderson, who is, is by no means old, but she's, you know, she's been in the industry for 30 years, more than that. Mm -hmm. And to see her turning out what I would argue is maybe her best performance to date, looking at Olivia Coleman getting to play this incredible role, looking, the, looking at the roles that Meryl Streep is continuing to play. And she's even moved over to streaming. Not a great, not a great film, but she's actually started doing some streaming stuff as well. But it's just, it's so great. I think that's one of the most positive things that are coming out of how big streaming is becoming is the incredible wealth of diversity in storytelling, in voices, in everything that we're getting to see. There's something out there for everyone. And people are truly realizing, hey, guess what? Watching these seasoned performers do what they do and do it so well is great for all of us. And do you think, Todd, that like building on that, there's a lot more creative freedom on the production end because you are not specifically looking to just draw audiences into a theater? There absolutely is. That's I mean, that you nailed it right on the head. The opening the opening weekend box office doesn't matter when you're streaming. All that matters is keeping and drawing subscribers and the more content and and there and, you know, kudos to Netflix for realizing the more diverse content that you put out there, the more likely you are, you are to keep all these quadrants interested in staying subscribed to your service. So I'm just I'm so thrilled that not only does the crown seem to be we don't get numbers released from Netflix, but that the crown seems to be doing really well with viewership. But the Emmys are showing that. Okay, yeah, it is it is a work of art that people should be tuning into. I was just going to say, streaming also has flexibility that not even the premium stations have, although it's pretty similar to the premium stations. They're able to do whatever they want. There's very little sort of oversight in terms of their content, provided it just doesn't get into that X-rated place. But they can, they can, they really have sort of the blank check to do whatever they want topically and however they want to do it with as much graphicness or as little as they want with whatever language they want. And so to that end, a lot of the TV that is on the streaming services, Netflix included, feels cinematic in scope. Yeah. We were, I, was, I was reading a thing on some, I don't know, Vulture or something about, just as we mentioned Ted Lasso, which I love very much, of the sheer amount of their music licensing budget, of the amount of Rolling Stones they've used this season, as an example. I, I went back and just looked, because I remember when Mad Men used that Beatles song, and it being $250,000. And they licensed it, and oh my goodness. And I'm like, apparently Apple has already spent, I mean, just I'm just doing like a little calculation. I'm like, they've spent like millions of dollars on music licensing, where I'm like, nobody has that kind of just sheer ability. 
And, but Only with, Apple. <laughs> and, but there's something to be said for being able to use the real version of songs that really just bring something, a, a certain different level of joy and kind of puts it in a certain place. Where using a cover, you're like, oh, they're using a cover. Hmm. Well, yeah, and, and that is interesting, the amount of money that they're putting into certain things that normally you wouldn't have. Enjoy it while it lasts, because I think that bubble will burst, you know, because now we're getting so fragmented with so many different streaming platforms that you have to have if you want to watch all the stuff you want to watch. Now it's actually more expensive than it was to have cable <laughs> with all the different channels Not if you quite. want all the stuff. Not quite. You know? ways. There, well, okay. Well, yeah, like, yeah. like with my iPhone, I got free Apple TV. How that, long? Yeah, that's that's good. I mean, and enjoy those too while they last because Correct. they're trying. What they want to do is they want to get up to an X number of subscribers, and then they'll know they've hit kind of critical mass. But that is that is fantastic because having that versatility is. I mean, you got Amazon that is reportedly spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for a new Lord of the Rings series, like the most money that's ever been spent on a television series in history because Jeff Bezos loves Lord of the Rings and just wants to have a Game of Thrones. I They're throwing it. so much money at it. It's insane. It's insane. Eventually, I'm sure they'll break it off from Prime and you have to pay extra for Prime streaming, but so far they haven't. Right. Jeff Don't get any yes. ideas. Well, and yeah. before anyone gets excited, the Lord of the Rings thing is going to be on the second age, so it's a prequel to the main yeah. events, so you have to be a real nerd to like it, but that's for that podcast, which we'll probably <laughs> do because I'm obsessed. Spencer, you and no matter decision. what, when the when that when that show happens, we're still all going to dislike Charles. So there that's you go. true. Absolutely. Very true. All right, let's attempt to bring this back to the program. While well, Spencer was trying to say something twenty minutes ago, <laughs> it, it's fine. It's completely out of context now. Oh, you could. It was it was really piggybacking on the back of what you you said anyway. So it's all good. Okay, Spencer. While we try, so, Sp Spencer, you can talk first after my next question. How about that? If I have something to say. <laughs> Oh, well, we're talking no pressure. About, we're so we're talking spicy. about the Bell Moral Test, which I think is BS. But well, I think a lot of the stuff that we saw and found displeasurable about the royal family and about things like the Bell Moral Test, I don't know how much truth there is to those, and how much of that is just the dramatization of the writers putting stuff in there to to flesh things out and to really make you it seems like there is an agenda from the writers to an extent with both how they treat the royals and how they treat all of the characters in this nobody really comes out of the show with any sort of positive light at least not in this season in some of the previous ones i i feel that there, there were some characters that got a little bit more in the way of a positive light, but overall, it, it does feel like there's a maybe even some sort of a jealousy from the writers, perhaps, that makes them paint everybody with a negative brush. So the Bell Moral Test is alleged, based on, you know, quote-unquote insiders. So no one actually could, probably connected with the royal family, but people maybe who drove past Belmoral Castle. But the Thatchers head on up up to Scotland and try and fail miserably to pass the series of little tests from the royal family. And then at Camilla's behest, Diana heads on up and nails it, which really puts her in contention for getting married to Charles because that's what it's all about. Talk about a booby prize. Hmm. <laughs> all a matter of perspective. <laughs> It's endearing that there's someone for everyone, no matter how but terrible it's not they are. Awesome. Samantha, they're all so nice. I was going to say, tell me how that all worked out. <laughs> it's Camilla. I mean, for I mean, Camilla just married Carol. Camilla. I agree. <laughs> Would have been much better for everyone. Damn. He could, you know what? If he'd uh, followed the, who would have been his great uncle, right? Edward the Eighth. Yeah. If he'd have followed Bertie's example. Nazi? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'm not saying he should have become a fascist. What I'm saying is, <laughs> if he had abdicated his potential trajectory to the kingship, he could have had what he wanted. But that's the that's the the quandary around Prince Charles, both on the show and in real life. He wanted it all. He wanted his cake and to eat it too, as some other royal person might have said at one point. <laughs> and Anne probably would have done well. I guess, but the, the, this whole should have married Camilla thing is really water under the Tower Bridge. <laughs> so... <laughs> Nicely played. I like so, to help. 
The bloody, bloody tower. LS. <laughs> I'm listening to a podcast about the Tudors right now. So much blood. Hey, we covered that show, and we had two panelists pan the heck out of it. Find that in our feeds. Plug. CPU podcast. <laughs> No, the actual tutor is not the show. I understand. I was segueing <laughs> back to TV. <laughs> I, I would like to point out that Charles actually couldn't marry Camilla because at the time she was still married to somebody else. That is correct. <laughs> well, and that's on her too for marrying that other guy whose name I can't remember. Andrew, who Prince <laughs> Anne was screwing Winky. around with. <laughs> It's all very yeah, think, scandalous yeah. and dodgy. At least according to the Crown, they kind of got a two-for-one deal, the royal family, by marrying those two off together. They thought they'd solve the problems. <laughs> yes. They made the problems go away, but not really. Well, and, and to your question regarding the Balmoral test, it, very uncomfortable from the perspective of Thatcher and her husband, of just that awkwardness of how the royals are very much in their own little happy bubble of like, this is what we do, and going about their business, and, and the rest of us are just, it's, I equated us as outsiders to Thatcher's experience of like, this is bananas, people and but i mean there was <laughs> later in the season er, her own bananas. cringeworthy <laughs> moments of like when she was doting on her son and being very motherly and having her her meetings up in her apartment essentially she cooks for them because she's a lady i know yeah. very, very uncomfortable for the feminists in the room <laughs> but, but but you're raising the feminism thing but that's also the point of the episode right because they're showing a thatcher mm -hmm. not thatcher as peasant but thatcher as somebody who has to over in some ways overcompensate for her role as female prime minister and then she's she's really just meeting She's meeting the queen. It's a big occasion. Nobody gave her the dress code prior to the point. So how would I, you know you that you don't dress for dinner for drinks? Oh no, I'm saying oh, where it's uncomfortable is is later in the season. I, I, I have know, a lot of I sympathy for her early in the season, and and not to knock her as like not being feminist enough. That's that's not what I mean at all. It's it's more of the things she had to do because of what was expected of like cooking right. for everyone. Got it. Because I'm the woman. Up. Because so much of public persona is so tough and groundbreaking. So to see some of those behind the scenes components were just like, oh, man. So I, I would say that the writer of this did not have a lot of love for Margaret Thatcher as a person because of politics. And I would also say that Margaret Thatcher crushed more men's souls than probably any woman in history. <laughs> She was strong. She didn't take any crap from anybody. And while politically history may not look at her fondly, as far as a, a woman basically taking a whole generation of young girls and showing them that they could be powerful, they could be strong, they could be leaders, that's something that is quite often overlooked purely on a political basis. Right. And that's where I, I think I go back to that, you know, behind the scenes, someone involved in the creation doesn't like these people <laughs> because they, they portray those uncomfortable moments and not not comfortable to watch, but also not comfortable to relate to either. I say, having seen The Audience, which is also written by Peter Morgan, the portrayal of Thatcher is different than Thatcher's portrayed in this series, but it's, it's still painted with a very negative brush. So that connection I, definitely seems to be there for the writer. And I think part of that is because if you notice seasons prior to this, there is a different tone. And all of the seasons prior to this take place before the writer was living in their 20s and having those experiences firsthand and having those experiences firsthand where things were happening in the world in a way that they didn't like. And I think that those tones of personal experience from a writer perspective are reflected in the difference of tone between season four and the previous three seasons. I don't know that there's been, aside from Churchill, I don't know that there's been an especially sympathetic depiction of any of the prime ministers really aside from uh, churchill it was during margaretology they didn't get along at first i don't know the I'll titles of episodes krista you're gonna <laughs> hold please while i look this up okay what shall we talk about while she's looking well, this up? if i can chime in for just, just one second on that that i think that's 
that's interesting too, because I wonder how much of that, again, this is me not knowing an awful lot about how particularly Britons look at the royal family and the, the role of the prime minister. But I wonder how much of it is, too, the fact that, you know, the prime minister is usually the one that's got to make the tough decisions. They're the ones that are really making choices and running the country while the royal family is the figurehead. They're there they're there to show they're there for show. And I wonder if that's part of why not only are they represented this way. And I, I felt immense sympathy and I, I felt very connected to Thatcher in this, which I thought was marvelous. I felt a huge amount of sympathy for her and and appreciation for her and admiration of her through this season. But I wonder if that's part of why, as well, our our prime ministers are maybe not connecting as well or are portrayed that way. I don't know, maybe... Harold Macmillan was the one that was portrayed with a bit more sympathy. Mm. I was saying Harold Wilson. Wilson, sorry. Har- Harold Wilson was, and to your point, point Todd I wonder how much at least this is what for me personally the sympathy I had for Thatcher was because of Gillian Anderson's portrayal not necessarily her and her policies because I just know that a lot of what she did set women and other you know minority types back a bit sure well and I I felt like for me a lot of the sympathy came from the way they were portraying what she was struggling with, being this strong woman amidst a bunch of men. And if you're, I mean, women still deal with this today, unfortunately. Hopefully it's getting better. I don't know. I hope that it's getting a little bit better, but it's that whole idea of, yeah, if a man is tough, they're a winner. If a woman's tough, she's a bitch. Sorry, but, you know, bleep that if you have to. But, you know, it's that she was dealing with that in an immense way in A, a different time and in a country where, you know, what you show to the public is even more important than it is almost anywhere else in the world. And I felt so much for that struggle she was having. I don't think she did it with any desire to be a trailblazer for women's rights. That's just who she was as a human Truly. being. That yeah. is, that's a, that's a true point. And I mean, I thought about it just today of if I was a man, would I apologize for being tough? I mean, right. and it's 2021, maybe? Right. I, I don't I, remember what you were as anymore. Yeah, I totally agree with Todd's take on it. I think I did not see it as a non-sympathetic portrayal, writer-wise or performance-wise nor did I see it as kind of the other sliding on the other side of the spectrum place, Krista, that you just described. I think what they were really trying to go for with Margaret Thatcher in this series was her position as the first woman in the prime minister role relating to the subject of the show, the Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth II. And I think the party politics played a little bit of a role because in real life, Margaret Thatcher was that conservative. That She she was part of that party and arguably would never have been, the first female would not have been a liberal anyway in England. It just wouldn't have happened. It would never have been a Labor Party person. So that piece of it was backdrop, not necessarily, I think, an attack on Thatcher. I think it was much more the context how she related to her male co-cabinet members in in the council there and how she related to the queen and the contrast between the two. And then also as a triangle point, a triangle point perspective, how she was in her private life with her husband and her son. I I, I think they were just trying to give her dimension, which I don't think was not sympathetic at all. I did find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, to your point, yes. Absolutely. I guess I just had a little bit harder time separating the reality of her policies versus the portrayal I was seeing on the TV. And that's a great point, too, Chris, because admittedly, again, I didn't follow a whole lot of that. So I, I, I'm not even fully aware of her policies later after that, you know, season takes place or anything like that. So I don't, I'm not bringing any of that into it as well. So I may have been even a little bit more sympathetic to her character, not knowing necessarily exactly what she stood for on, on policies that I would be very passionate about personally. What about her relationship with her daughter? Which was another dimension of the private life, right? And the mm-hmm. expectation expectations that she had for her daughter versus yeah. her son versus her son and how there she- was a little bit of there was a little bit of mirroring there between how the queen deals with charles and how margaret deal dealt with her daughter i found fascinating 
Mm-hmm. Which is where I think, I was just going to say, that's where I think the show shines the hardest is when it searches for those little parallels between sort of the working people of the government, the working people that the royals relate to versus the royals themselves, showing their human dimension, but also how the human dimension differs because they have the duty to the state of which is the crown and, and everything that comes with it. My favorite moment of the season was after she had been ousted as prime minister and that moment between her and Elizabeth and despite all of their battles over the years and and not getting along that there was still that level of respect between them. Yeah, that was a beautiful moment. And again, that goes back to the scenes between Gillian and Olivia were just so strong. They were for me, and I think for a lot of us, the best moments of this season. Agreed. Agreed. I particularly enjoyed the quiet moment she had when she found out that she, or she cried. And it was just so, I don't know, obviously, no, like, sympathetic, not in, like, a schadenfreude kind of way. Like, I wasn't happy she was sad. It was just so truthful that a lot of us, we don't want to say that we're sad or upset or we're, we're saying, we're fine, we're fine, you know? I mean, even when something terrible happens, getting to see that moment of just pure despair, because this is something that she worked so hard for, to just have it be gone. Especially when that's such a big part of who you are as a person. If there's one thing that came across really well, it's what her priorities were in her life, at least this this representation of her. And yeah, it's 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 a it's akin to working for for years and years and years for, on one project that is of importance to you for your job or your career, the thing that you're most passionate, and then all of a sudden it's just gone. It's just gone. And whoo, yeah. And I think she's a great example, too, of a character that just reiterates how very important it is to have balance in life, you know? And I think they did a good job of representing that she kind of did, but it's like you felt this distance from her, or at least I did, from all the people in her life. Like, even the people that she was kind of close to, like, I learned nothing about her husband. I mean, her husband was almost like, oh, by the way, there's this guy that she obviously cares about. But it it was almost like they're like, but no, the most important thing to her is her job, is what she does. And and so finding that balance, it was kind of heartbreaking that maybe there wasn't a little bit more of that in the, at least in the way she's portrayed in this. And I think that was kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, a lot of that does come in betrayal as, as opposed to reality, though. Her and Dennis had a very loving relationship and he was absolutely besotted with her. Mm-hmm. and did everything he could to never detract from her position. Let's not forget that Margaret Thatcher was also the longest-serving prime minister in, I, I want to say, somewhere around 100 years. I went back into the 1800s, and nobody served as long as she wow. did. Tony yeah. Blair made it about a year shy of what she did. So those two polar opposites, in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. were unpopular to and polarizing figures, Yet they were able to maintain power, Margaret, for over 11 years and Tony for over 10. There were, there's a lot to be said for how she ran the country. And we just have to remember that this show was written by somebody who has a polar opposite political viewpoint than she did. So the way in which she is painted is going to be painted with that lens. I st- I'll be curious I'm how Tony is con- painted. Well, I'm still, yeah, there's that. I'm still not convinced that there's a lens based on politics, but I guess we will compare when we get into the Tony Blair years, which is very shortly here. So, and the Amelia yeah, Stunt in season five. If you've seen, if you if you see the show, The Audience, which, as Kristen alluded to earlier, was also written by the same penman, there's definitely a bias. Yeah, and I think it's most obvious in, oh gosh, what was the episode with the sanctions? And almost portraying her a oh, forty-eight to one, to where one, yeah. just showed her as being just unrelenting about apartheid. Yes, yes, and just that nope, you won't, you won't move me at all. And even though they have moments of portraying her in a sympathetic way, you can see just this sort of dislike of nope, you, you can't change my mind, no matter what you say. Well, that might be true. I mean, and whether, might well, have, whether that's like, realistic or not, but just how it was portrayed of her, you know, going through with her red pen and nope, nope, you know, her, just 
Just her, how it was played. Her nickname is uh, uh, Iron Lady, and she was a Tory. Like, I don't know what else to say. There's, 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 if there I, I think lens, when they do paint her with any sympathy, though, it is from a position to show weakness as opposed to strength. Oh, interesting. I'd agree with that. I would disagree with it. I think it was not weakness, but adding a human dimension to a person that has traditionally been we've already talked about her strength the length of her tenure and etc i think she's always she's always been she's always like shown in photographs with ronald reagan and mikhail gorbachev for example as like the three powers a commanding figurehead somebody who could not be moved the fact that we're seeing the the red pen stuff and apartheid all of that happened I mean, this isn't like it was made up facts for that piece of it. So you don't have to agree with what she says, and neither does really Peter Morgan. I, some of the stuff she did was hardline stuff, you know. But I do think, I don't know why I'm getting so ranty, but <laughs> because I don't agree. You know, I'm politically not aligned with Margaret Thatcher, but I don't think it was to depict weakness I do think it was trying to show dimensionality to somebody who has perhaps not been given that same amount of dimensionality in real life reports of how she conducted herself in government and on the global stage. Passion over. <laughs> All right. Well, as I prepare to move on, do we have any further comments about the Iron Lady herself? Did they depict, we hit on the Falklands at all in this season, I don't recall. We do bit. hit on the Falklands, yeah. yes. Okay, they didn't really show some of the events in that to its entirety. I followed that very closely as a young adolescent boy. I even had a scrapbook of newspaper clippings, etc. And you want to talk about somebody showing strength. There were decisions that she made and things that she did during that conflict, which I don't think were shown in the show. Some I of agree. them were, they just weren't. They didn't meditate on that piece for some reason, which is interesting because it's one of her more famous, I guess, or sets of decisions, if you will. But that's okay. Yeah, I can only speculate as to why they didn't show some of those decisions, especially as they were some of the stronger ones made during her tenure. Let us move on, perhaps, to Princess Margaret. I know one thing I wanted to personally touch on was the episode, The Hereditary Principle, where she, now most of this is fictionalized, but it does speak a lot to how they hid away their cousins. The way, even the way I wrote the question was very Harry Potter about being pure blood. I don't know how, again, like I said, the actual events of like Margaret finding out are fictionalized, but they really did hide away their cousins. And I, I, I just kind of, me personally, I find the purpose of this episode to kind of point out how not great things still are as much as we think we are forward thinking. And I just kind of wanted to see if anyone else had any thoughts on that. My take on this is I think we finally really, really got to see why they cast Helena Bonham Carter. Yeah, it, yeah. I think they saw, this is what they were really looking at were these later plot lines. And yeah, I really, she really got to shine in, in that episode in particular. We don't get to see her get kidnapped though. Oh, that's Princess Anne, my mistake. Well, who was kidnapped? Somebody kidnapped this season and I missed it? <laughs> no, in real life, someone was kidnapped. Oh, okay. They didn't. I was like, I don't remember that. I can't answer that question. To answer your previous question, Helena Bonham Carter is, she's Helena Bonham Carter. Like, she's great in this role. But so much of the Margaret stuff, I mean, it, we're talking about the lens of the writer. The Margaret stuff is so sensational because a lot of what was reported on Margaret was so sensational. So it's hard to know what is absolute truth and what isn't. But Helena's doing a great job with the, the words on the page that she's given to kind of project. It was Princess Anne. Princess Anne was kidnapped or attempted. There, there was never actually a kidnapping. It, it was There was an attempt, but no, there wasn't a kidnapping. Spencer would know. I suppose I particularly found this interesting because it reminded me so much of Jackie Kennedy and her family, of how they were hidden away, and it was just kind of an interesting parallel, considering how the Kennedys considered themselves American royalty, and then, so I don't know if perhaps Peter Morgan was taking, a, I don't know, a page out of that book. We know who it was that made the decision to hide the cousins away, which generation that fell under? It sounds like it was the Queen Mother's family so uncles great uncles children it was probably a group decision being that she was married to the king at one point i but i don't 
I did not research this. And honestly, watching the episode didn't inspire me to do so, I guess. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that it happened or that it existed, but I don't have really much response to this question, I guess. Great All podcast! Right. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on, since I'm the only one that found whatever. Your feelings are valid! My feelings are valid. <laughs> so, to bring us back a little bit kind of full circle to Diana and Uptown Girl, which I personally enjoyed, that butthead did not... And then that sort of circles us back to the ending, just a tiny bit. Dana goes to New York, and then goes to Christmas, and it's terrible. What did we think? How do we think the season ended? Did we think it went well? Did we think we got everything out of it we wanted? I do enjoy the fact that you called Prince Charles butthead. Yeah, I was like, who? <laughs> what? <laughs> did we switch shows? Where's Mike Judge? Okay, it's <laughs> Prince Charles. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I'm here for the joke. Samantha, you were trying to say something. Even though it was uncomfortable, I liked the conversation between Diana and Philip. Because it was so just... Cringy. Well, not so much... Well, cringy, yes. But it just sort of wrapped up the whole <laughs> theme of all the episodes this season. This is the machine. This is what you signed up for when you married him. It is what it is, essentially. Yeah, it was a it was a great way of of again bringing back up to that to a much lesser degree. Philip went through similar things of having to give up his life for to be part of this family, and I yeah I, I it's all about the crown. It's all about the crown. It's all about the crown. It's the name of the show, and and I thought this ended very this ended very nicely or very interestingly because I thought. The way that I can't remember the actress's name that played Diana again. Emma Corrigan. Yeah. So the way the way she played the character through the whole season, and the way it just kept Dude, her deterioration her. of her own psyche as the season went on, I think is going to build very nicely into the next season where Elizabeth Debicki is going to be taking over that role. And I'm very intrigued to see the fully adult version of Diana, which I think Elizabeth Debicki is incredibly, per is, is just perfect to play. And we saw that starting, we saw the trajectory of where that's heading through this whole season. So yeah, it, it was heartbreaking. This season was, and I know we talked about that earlier a bit, that this was just a heartbreaking season. It just was, it, it felt a little bit, bit more like the overall arc of this season was a little more specific than what we had in previous seasons. This was definitely a Diana arc over the whole season, whereas I think previous seasons felt a little bit more like, hey, now we're focusing on this character. Now we're focusing on this character. Now we're focusing on this character, you know, without a little bit more of that. And maybe that was part of why it was so tragic was, again, we're watching this through yet another character who had to give up everything in order to be part of this family and truly did not understand what she was signing up for. Philip, I think, understood a little bit more. I think most of these other characters understood a little bit more and some of them were born into it. But boy, Diana, she had no idea what she was signing up for when she fell into all of this. And I think that was why it was such a heartbreaking season for me. Yeah, I think they wanted to bring us to a very specific place to launch season five. Right. Of course. I just, we've barely mentioned it, but I really want to say that, and while I'm looking forward to the next cast and sort of the 90s, 2000s version, which we all remember probably pretty graphically, Emma Corrigan as Diana did such an amazing job. She captured her mannerisms. She captured her vocal inflections. She, There was really, I suspended disbelief very effectively watching Emma in sort of the young Diana role and thought it was very interesting the way she related off the different actors. And I also just want to say yet again how wonderful Tobias Menzies is as Prince Philip. Oh, Such a yeah. vast improvement yeah. to as much as I love the Doctor Who man, Matt Smith. Such a such a vast improvement to Matt in this role. He mm -hmm. he really is Prince Philip, and I've seen him now in quite a few things, and it it never. But I never think of those other roles when I'm watching him as Prince Philip. He's so good at. He it. won the Emmy too. He deserved yeah, you, it. <laughs> you could not have had a better improvement of a portrayal than you did from Matt Smith to Tobias night and day. I, I, whenever I watched Matt Smith in the role, I was always bothered. It seemed so one dimensionally he had this thing where he would constantly be looking down and then flicking his eyes up when he talked. It was just very odd. 
With regard to Diana, she the, the thing I think that made the performance so compelling is she really captured the the shyness and the charming aspect of that shyness and yet the ability to connect with people at the same time. And children especially. The the episodes that started to veer into the children's work that Diana mm-hmm. did later in life, I thought those were very accurately done and she was very good in kind of recreating those scenes that we've seen play out in the media in the past. Just a really, really good casting. I, I felt I've really enjoyed these middle series cast members, Olivia Coleman, Tobias, all of the the individuals playing the princes and princess and and related going out, Helena, all of them. I think they've all done a really, really good job in ways that maybe I appreciate a little bit more than the first first two series cast. I know people might have different opinions, but I really enjoyed the middle series, and that's what I'm going to say. I am finding myself wondering how they're going to pick up for season five with the changing from Olivia to Imelda. There's going to have to be a time jump there. I'm guessing, although it's just a guess, that we're going to go straight to the mid-90s. That would be my guess, too. It's it's really the only way to handle that transition. Yep, and we're going to be watching the falling apart of the marriage and... Diana's death pretty early on, I would I would guess. Well, that was my next question: is what are what are our predictions for season five? That, <laughs> and <laughs> I think we're gonna jump right to the the interview with Charles, where he announces that he's with Camilla and the revenge dress, and like that'll be episode one. I w- I would be shocked if Diana's death isn't episode two or three. Oh, I think, really? I think we need, because I mean, Tony Blair and everybody, it all happens at about the same time, and I think we need, I think the aftermath might be two or three episodes. And Imelda Staunton isn't that much older than Olivia Coleman. It's probably, I may be a decade, but you know, I think they will probably, I, I think we're seeing a lot of clips of her in sort of the grayer, more winter years of the queen, but I think they will start her off not in that spot and kind of transition her probably in the first couple of episodes to the queen we're more familiar with in the last 20 years. I think it's going to I think the progression's going to be pretty fast because so much of that has already been lived by the people who are consuming the show. So So here's a, here's an interesting question and we haven't seen this in the in the seasons to this point. I don't think I don't think we've seen this all. Is there a possibility we may see more of a time jump within the season? That this season might cover a longer span of time than we're used to in previous seasons and you know, like you said, with casting Imelda Staunton, she could play she could play a range of twenty to thirty years easily in that character. So I wonder if we might see any sort of a time jump in within the season at all. I, I doubt yeah, I just, it. I just feel there needs to be a time jump for that that change in actresses in this particular instance. Well, I mean, not from season four to season five, but within season five itself, might we see another jump of time within that? Might it cover a broader scope of time, I wonder? Yeah, it's hard to tell. Like I, I said, I think, we're... think that we're going to spend a lot of time in the mid-90s. Yeah, we're going to, and I think Amelda, her gray wig, if you will, is not going to come until later. I, she's, I think she looks younger than she is, and I think she can play quite a few different years, which is why she was cast. Sure. Yeah. Also, and she was Dolores one. Umbridge, and I can't look at her because she was <laughs> Dolores Umbridge. It's very hard. Who was the real villain of Harry Potter? Don't let anybody... We must not tell At least one of them. The majority of the history that is coming up all takes place starting in, like, 1997, because Blair was, I think, became Prime Minister in May Mm -hmm. of 97, and Diana died in August. So that's a great deal that happens towards the end of the 90s. There's a lot. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how and where they pick up. When, When was that interview? I think it was, like, 95, right? Yeah, so I think we'll go 95. I think we'll spend... I would be shocked if we even hit 2,000. Yeah, I agree. I think we'll. it'll be a slow-moving season as opposed... Because I because th- so much happens. And so much that people really care, especially the viewing audience, really pers- really cares about. So then, then the final season will kind of bring us to... Maybe not present, but might bring us to, like, William and Kate's wedding. Yeah, oh yeah. 
because we don't want to get be, into which that. Which I personally think would be a great way to end it. Start with a wedding, end with a wedding. So take notes. People from The Crown, if you're listening, Sarah's not here, so I gotta say this. We'd love to know what your trajectory is for the sixth season. If you would care to talk to our humble little podcast, tweet at us, CPU Podcast. <laughs> this is Sarah's job, Or if you'd like to bring any here. of us in to consult, we will all happily take the money. Well, or what I'm, what I'm for looking free. forward to is when they run out of history and they pull a Game of Thrones and they just decide to continue the story on in the future and show us what's going to happen in the next two decades. See, what happened is Todd has not watched the show and we told him about it and now he thinks he knows. (laughs) 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 So, there's a (laughs) a play called Charles the (laughs) Fourth. I don't know who it's been. I don't think it's Peter Morgan, but you know, it's speculative. That made me throw up in my mouth a little. Is that like in the future? Queen will outlive us all. It's fine. I don't think that's true. <laughs> I, I really wish that were true, but I don't see it happening. No. She does have her 75th Jubilee coming up in June. She will have been on the throne for 75 years. I think it's it's either 70 or 75. I may have misled you the other day. Don't mislead me on a podcast. I do, I do, I <laughs> when do we're on think the record. it's Anywhere else is fine, but not in public. I, I, I think it is 75 because she surpassed Queen Victoria as now the longest. The Platinum Jubilee marks 70 years of a monarch's reign. Queen Elizabeth is the first British monarch to mark this accolade after being crowned in 1952 so it will be the 70th anniversary okay. in 2022 that's what i said the other day yes you were right and i Victoria. was wrong and i am correcting that for the record in front of all the wonderful podcast listeners well, thank that you was nice. <laughs> today is bringing me so much joy <laughs> well, i am so glad i can spread the love <laughs> Dynamics. <laughs> All right. As we bring this wonderful episode to a close, does anyone have any further thoughts about season four? I just hope there's a little bit of, I don't know, maybe this is the part of me that is still a little bit optimistic. I, I look forward to seeing maybe a little bit of hope for some of the characters. I know because of knowing history that some of them will not find that hope but yeah you know? i'd like to maybe just to see a little bit of a hopeful bent with some of the writing some of the some of the ter- some of the characters at least having watched a number of epi- of movies and stuff about what comes up there's been a, mu- a multitude of portrayals and how things are handled so i will be very very curious to how this all shakes out I'm yes. not anticipating any kind of happy ending or hopeful note, but that's nice of you. <laughs> not a happy ending, but I don't know. I can't help having a little hope. I think it'll be interesting to see, since there's already been talk about lenses being added to this depiction, if you will, what the lens is of future of the royal family going forward from wherever they decide to end. Because I do think, I think the show has been very deliberate about being both adulating as well as critical, depending upon the the thing that's being portrayed. And so, depending on what... I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a rather bold prediction here and a sad one. I believe that by the time we get around to season six, there will be a new monarch on the throne. That is, I don't like this. Don't say that. <laughs> and ending the podcast. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> hey, I'm just saying it how I see it. I, you know, when when someone you've been married to for away. when someone you've been married to for a multitude of years passes, the other person generally, in a lot of cases, does not last. For a long time behind, I'm very hopeful that Her Majesty will be on the throne for a few more years yet. And mostly I hope she makes it through to that 70th Jubilee next year. But she's in her mid to late 90s. This is not an age that a lot of people get beyond. She's she led a healthy her. life. Yeah, I mean, she, she by accounts is heartbroken at the loss of Philip. Maybe so, so floating Spencer's head, but I don't want to start talking about predicting the passing but, away of current. But I'm predicting that season six, we will see the transition from our current monarch to the next one, be it Charles or be it William, depending on how that pans out. You mean within the show, like they'll actually take it there? No, I, I, I think we'll see it in reality and then in the show, because if season five isn't until the end of 2022... 
there's a very good chance we won't get a season six until 2023, 2024. You're majorly bumming me out, Spencer. Yeah, I stand by um, <laughs> I'm a realist. For all of my gripes about the royal family, I do adore Elizabeth. Oh, I I always have and I always will. I also find it, I mean, not lovely. I think it's great. Not, okay, she loved her husband and it wasn't fake and that's awesome. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. But awesome. obviously, yeah. I'm not going to say it's great that she's sad because that's awful. Right, but, but it also shows the amount of love. Yeah, it's, it's great that she had the love and that it wasn't all for show. I think that's a nice note. <laughs> and I think we need to better than my note. Yes. Let's, let's end on that before Spencer talks again. Yes. <laughs> Man. Exactly. Yay, love. Yay, love. Yay, love. <laughs> love conquers all. Fun that's fact, right. I will be married when the next season comes out. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> That's something I thought about when I saw that it was November 22. I'm like, huh, all right. Wow. Watch party on your honeymoon. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think that brings us to a close of season four of The Crown. Thank you, Kylie, Spencer, Samantha, Kristen, and Todd. We had a wonderful time talking about this delightful program, and I can't wait to bring it back for season five. Me too. And thank oh, you, Krista, for moderating our Crown panel and series four. And because, we, because we've discussed series four, in such a grandiose and sometimes maudlin manner, it's now time for the credits. Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation Point was produced by Back Pocket Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Couch Potato, which is really another way of saying executively produced by me, Kylie Piette. My associate producers are Krista Pennington and Celine Resmer. I edit this podcast, and our logo is by Rebecca Wallace. Our marketing graphic artist is Krista. Our theme song was written by Sarah Milbratz and sung by Sarah, Amy McDaniel, and Kels Resmer. Kels played the keyboard, Ian McDonough played the bass, Christian Somerville played the guitar, and the whole shebang was engineered by Kyle Aspinall and Christian. We hail from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us, give us stars, provide comments, or review us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, and Amazon are just a few of the places you can find us, but we're also on YouTube. We have our website. Otherwise, feel free to tell us how we're doing, what we should add, subtract, keep, or toss. You know how it goes. And if you have suggestions for shows we might consider, contact us at our website where we have a guest book by email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, our Facebook, our Twitter at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, or wherever you get your podcasts. Though, of course, we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time and always have new episodes coming down the pipe. Just listen to our intros. If you miss old episodes or want to know in general what shows we cover, just search for us. Find us wherever you do searchable things on the internet. Don't forget that exclamation point. Or contact us via our website, our email, our social media accounts, and stay up on all the new events and episodes by our humble little podcast, Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point. Until the next time, all available seasons of The Crown are available to stream on Netflix, as that is the network who makes it. Not because we like to say their name. In the meantime, our crown panel will next reconvene following the release of the fifth season, which, as they have indicated, is November 22 of 2022. No, just November 2022. Okay, there you go. November 2022. So it'll be a while, folks. But you can listen to our series to stay caught up until then. As always, keep a weathered eye to Couch Potatoes Unite for all the details. In the meantime, and until next time, until next episode, new episodes are published every Wednesday. Keep listening. Keep watching. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Good night.